what made you transition? What, why wine? Like, what made you transition from baseball to wine? That's the fun thing about being in the, in the wine industry. Hey, what up, everybody? This is Jay Tom Gunter, owner of Grapes and Sand Publishing. We're here for another episode of Step Up to the Palate. I'm with my boy, Scott Hairston, and uh, we're drip- drinking on some wine, and we're talking about it, and we can't wait to get into this show with you. What up, Scott? How you doing over there, brother? Good. How are you doing, Jay Tom? I am great, man. I am great. I'm enjoying uh, just smelling this wine. I'm, I'm not going to taste it yet because I want to break this down for you guys in person, but on the nose, this is already jumping out. And uh, today, by the way, we're talking about this Malbec. Uh, we're talking, but mainly we're talking about pairing. So we're going to be talking about pairing wines with food. We're just using this Malbec as a, a vehicle to get to that end goal, which is basically talking about food and wine. And the reason we're doing that, one of the main reasons we're doing that is because we have Thanksgiving coming up like in the next month. And we kind of want to give you guys a little education on pairing food with wine. Also, Scott may be going for his uh, intro uh, Psalm cert certification. And pairing is one of the things that is in that is on that test. So there's some like uh, popular pairings that are that everybody knows about in the wine industry. And you always go to these types of wines to pair with these types of foods. And so uh, I'm going to try to give them a little bit of that uh, throughout this uh engagement with you guys on uh on this on this show so let's get right into it man how by the way before i get into that how are you doing over there scott I, it's been it's been a minute since we've oh, we're doing great so yeah hey I'm, I'm excited to talk about malbec you know you know me i always talk about malbec and um it's one of my favorite varietals and uh it's it's one of the most i would say to me on the palate uh, i'm able to d- distinguish that um varietal over anything else oh, maybe really? it's just how bold it is or maybe I, i've had so much of it i'm able to 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 do that so i'm excited to talk about this this is one of my favorite i know you've had it in the past but we what we didn't talk about is parents Hello? so i need to get i need to get better at parents so i have guests over i need yeah so i'm excited to talk about Malbec because you know that's my favorite varietal and i love talking about it it's one of the varietals that I know that I have a good chance of knowing what it is as soon as if we're doing a blind tasting, which is very important when you're getting tested on it. And what I need to really, really learn about, and that's why we're doing it for the audience today, is what to pair it with, because it's not that easy. I, I know that, and, and everybody's palate is different, but if we can educate the audience today on the next time they open up a model back and they have guests over, they'll know what to pair it with. So also regions, we talked about briefly before, uh, we talked about Argentina, talked about Chile, which uh, this small that comes from. And um, obviously Argentina is, is the, the, the most, I guess, prevalent area where Malbec comes from, but I kind of want you to get into uh, various regions uh, to talk about that. So I'm excited to learn from you, man. And uh, Excited to talk more about it and expand on your knowledge on, on, on Malbec. Let's get into it, man. So as he was, as Scott was saying, uh, everybody knows about Malbec out of Argentina. It's like Mendoza, Argentina, all day, every day, for every meal, let's go. That's what everybody goes to when they talk about Malbec. Other places in uh, Argentina that makes really, really good Malbec are Salta, which is the northern part of Argentina, they make a little bit lighter on its feet, more food friendly. And then also um, Patagonia makes outstanding um, Malbec there too. But we're not even in Argentina today. We're talking about Chile. And Cochagua, which is where this, um, this um, Malbec comes from, uh, has very similar weather to like uh, Mendoza area. And so that's why they're able to do uh, Malbec here. There's not, what you don't know is that a lot of Malbec is not being grown in Chile. It's not one of their varietals. They leave that for Argentina and there's a couple places that grow, but it's not the main grape there. Uh, today though, we're talking about the Viente, uh, 2019 Malbec out of Colchagua. And here's the label, if you can see it. Uh, there you go. 
And so let's get right into this. And then we're going to go from here to the pairings, because there are quite a bit of pairings that I would I love to do with uh, Malbec, uh, some that are kind of like ingrained in its DNA and some that I've kind of picked out that I like myself. So let's get right into it. On the nose on this wine, get a good squirrel because I opened this up probably about 30 minutes ago. On the nose. So I get black plum, I get coffee grounds, I get a little bit of like a, um, I get like a beef jerky note too, like a, like a secondary beef jerky, like a cured meat type thing going on here. There's also like a bit of bitter chocolate on here too. I'm getting like a, a cacao count of like maybe 90% cacao chocolate. So it's like a little bit of a bitter chocolate, which I did because I, I like a little bit bitter in my food and my wine. Um, I guess that's why I like Italian wine so much. They always talk about how Italian has like a little bit of like a bitterness every single time you taste it on the finish, especially the white wines. And so I think I kind of gravitate towards, I gravitate towards a little bit of bitter for myself. Let's go ahead and smell a little bit more. There's also like this ripe raspberry thing on, on here. So there is some red fruit here too. A bit of like black salty olives. This is very complex in the nose, by the way. And lilacs. I'm getting like a little bit of like a, like a floral component, like lilacs going on here. And I know everybody's going to be like, how do you know the smell of lilacs? Okay, quick story. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I grew up in a Oakland and Antioch. And when we moved to Ant from Oakland to Antioch, um, by the way, really suburbs at the beginning and then turned into like the hood after but before I left from high school because everybody moved out there. Uh, but for a minute, it was like the suburbs, and I didn't identify with it because I'm from Oakland. So we was like, you know, it's 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 the hood, it's like the city. So it's a different different perspective there as opposed to Antioch. I got to a lot of issues when I got to Antioch because I did not understand these guys, and it was a bunch of Caucasian people. <laughs> and <then> I <laughs> have a conversation with them, uh, it, like a real conversation with them was very hard because a lot of times they had these ideas of black people not really knowing a black person. And it would drive me crazy. But anyway, I, I digress. Let's get back to the... To the we'll, we'll get into that stuff later, maybe another episode. <laughs> we'll definitely get into that. Uh, but I moved, when we moved from, Antioch, from Oakland to Antioch, we moved to this place called Lilac Lane in Antioch. And uh, all throughout Lilac Lane were lilacs, the flower. So I got used to the smell of it. Um, and so that's why I'm getting that in this wine. So just a heads up. A lot of times, the things that you identify in wine always takes you back to a memory, especially on the nose. It will all more, more than likely take you back to a memory if you have a memory attached to a certain smell. And so that's why I love smelling it and tasting it because being honest with you, this wine is a whole like, it's a whole like uh, vibe. Like it's a whole scene. You're painting a scene. You're, you're trying to understand everything that's going on. It's, it's not just drinking wine. You're trying to understand what's going on. And um that's why I smell, put my nose in the wine and taste it too at the same time. I got two questions for you. Okay, so you just brought this up. All right, so I read in a book somewhere that a lot of Psalms or most Psalms do not put on fragrance before they go tasting like cologne or perfume because they said it interferes with their experience. Now, are you the same way or can you say, no, I can wear cologne going out and be fine with taste my wine? Because I love cologne. I love wearing cologne. Man, I'm going to be honest with you. I used to wear so much, I, not so much to like overwhelm people. I'm talking about like, yeah. I had a bunch of cologne. I had a whole cologne section. I still have it upstairs. I just don't use it too much. Because I've been into this scene for so long and I've been into the wine scene, I haven't thrown on cologne in probably over two years. Like really? I just don't wear it at all anymore. It's, it's one of those things where I just got in the habit of not doing it. And there's no knock to anybody who does wear it because I like cologne. I still do. I just, because I am... In this scene, I've been drinking and tasting it for a living for a long time now. Um, I don't want to mess up my senses when I'm going to when I'm going to a tasting, so I don't wear it at all th throughout right. the day anymore. Um, maybe one yeah. day I'll get back to it when I get more on the writing side, which I'm trying to do right now instead okay. of just the tasting side, because uh, I do love cologne. I do, um, but yeah, man, I um, I don't I don't wear it with cologne anymore. It's, it, that's the first time I think I've said that out loud. I don't wear cologne anymore. <laughs> so well, that would be considered rude if you show up to a tasting wearing yeah. cologne or, okay. Yes. I've seen people uh, 
back in the day when we were working at when we were working at Eno, my old staff, people would come in the door and they'd be reeking of like um, cologne or not even cologne. A lot of times it was perfume. Uh, it was women that were coming in and they'd have this strong perfume on it. And then everybody in the bar that were wine people would be like, yo, really? Like they, this is what you're doing? Like you're messing up the whole experience for us. Oh, yeah. OK, so that maybe see that's something the audience needs to know, because I didn't know that yeah. until maybe three months ago. Yeah, maybe like a light dab or something, but like don't don't engulf our old our old factory senses. Like, like don't yeah. go too don't go over the top with it. A little dab, cool, because we always like to smell good. You know what I mean? But when you're going into a wine bar and you know people are gonna be putting their nose in the wine and trying to understand what's going on, don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Don't be that guy. And don't and don't be that gal. Because that's what a lot of times it was the gals that were doing that. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So an another question really quick. So I heard too, don't have your afternoon coffee before you go wine tasting. Now that I've heard and I stopped doing that, but then again, usually at wine tastings, they'll have coffee beans in a little glass for you to smell before you taste your next wine. So tell me the difference between having wine or excuse me, having coffee and then going to taste wine instead of in comparison to smelling the coffee beans and then going to taste so, wine. So if you're tasting, if you're drinking coffee before you, first of all, there's a temperature problem. So if you're, if you're drinking coffee, a lot of times it's hot and it has yeah. the potential to burning your palate. And right. also it's bold. So it overwhelms your palate too. So you don't want to drink coffee before you taste um, a recommendation when you know you're going to be blind tasting, do some high acid white wine. Recommendation would be Riesling. A dry Riesling, because it's high, it has natural high acid, will clear your palate of everything, and you'll be ready to go. Um, so that's my recommendation for the palate. On the nose, smelling coffee doesn't doesn't do any harm. It actually opens up your uh, opens up your nose a little bit to. Um, you know, be able to smell everything else because it, it immediately just hits your nose. It jumps out at you. Coffee has always like, it's that whole Folgers commercial, right? The mm -hmm. best time you open up at Folgers in your cup, you be sleeping in the bed, you smell coffee. This is real stuff. You smell coffee, you wake up like, yo, where, where is the coffee? So smelling it wakes you up, gets you ready. But tasting it could affect your palate and when you're trying to do blind tasting. So you don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, again, do like a high acid white wine and I think you'll be all good. You can taste anything after that. Okay. All right. So a little bit more about this Malbec. So you were right. So it says uh, black plum is listed in the taste notes. It says fruity, bold, red cherry, and wild berry jam. And then it says, uh, okay, the grapes of this single vineyard Malbec were handpicked from vines planted over a decade ago in the foothills of the Andes. After harvest, the grapes were immediately sorted, destemmed, lightly crushed, and placed in stainless steel vats where they were fermented on native yeast for 40 days. The wine then aged in stainless steel tanks with Frank, French oak uh, staves. Is that how you, how you pronounce it? Yeah, that's how it, you pronounce it. Staves, right. staves for eight months until bottling, unfined, and lightly filtered. And of course, this is from uh, Scout and Cellar. No additives, no added sugars, no chemicals added to it. It's vegan. Alcohol by volume is 14.5%. Uh, and it's at $27. So it's fairly reasonable in price. Oh, nice. Off the nose already, this is amazing. Um, I knew this was, I knew this was destemmed and everything. I knew this was a full cluster because I could, there wasn't a lot of green I was getting out of this. See, a lot of times, just a little side note, when you're talking about um, wine production, sometimes if you're a blind taster, you can find, if you know that certain wines are always a uh, full cluster, meaning that it's pressed, with the like, on, like, with the stems and everything, the seeds is pressed all together. Um, it helps you. It helps to direct your path onto figuring out which varietal it is. And a lot of times, Malbecs, from what I know, have been full clustered. But you get it on the nose when you smell something like that. You get a little bit of a green kind of herbal thing, uh, not green herbal, green earthy thing, on the mm -hmm. nose. This, I'm not getting it from. And that's what immediately thought made me think like, yo, this must be not full cluster. This must be destemmed or something like that. So that, that makes sense that it's, it's been, it was destemmed. 
It smells amazing. Let's, I want to talk about the palate, though, because I have not gotten a chance to really go into the palate. And we're all about drinking wine here, so let's get into yeah, it. Yeah, we've been talking too much. <laughs> Let me taste it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is good. So definitely that plum is still there. Black plum up front. You get into that raspberry, um, like kind of perfectly ripe, juicy raspberry in the mid palate. Um, it has a hint of spice here too. I'm getting like a little bit of like a, um, like a cardamom, like a cardamom spice here in the third quarter to the finish. The finish is very, very long. This is a very elegant wine. Great mouthfeel here. Tannins are medium, like to like medium. Like they're not even not even medium plus. This is in, like a very approachable red wine. Acid is acid is medium to medium plus. The berries are just jumping out, man. Like that berry, the wild berry thing that I'm getting. It's like really like sea walking all over my palate right now. It's like straight up dancing on my palate. It's like it's not it's no joke. This is a great wine, and we're talking about pairing, right? This wine for Thanksgiving would kill. I was talking about uh, on one of the on one of our episodes before how sparkling wine is 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 a great way to kind of wet your whistle before you get to the the main thing, maybe with a cheese, a triple cream, or whatever. This is for the main course. This is like. You want this for the turkey. You want this for like the stuffing with the with the gravy on top of it. Uh, you want this for the whole meal. This is a very well balanced wine and one that you can pair with numerous dishes. I think with the ham, it'll go really well. With the chicken, it'll go really well. This is a great wine. I'm really digging this. And it's so clean on the finish. I love it. Uh, people need to drink more Chilean Malbacs when you can find it. It's like a unicorn, as I was telling him before. Um, you don't see a lot of Chilean Malbacs. When you see it, you got to kind of grab it because, you know, it's something that's unique, something that you don't normally run into. So let me taste a little bit more of this. Oh. Yeah, I could drink this all. I could drink a whole bottle of this to the neck. This is really good. <laughs> Straight up. So let's talk about Malbec. I want to talk about, like, um, specifically what – people tend to go to Malbec for. People go to Malbec for beef. Um, a lot of beef dishes, uh, Malbec is akin to that because in that the market in, in Argentina is all about the beef. And because of that, Malbec has to be able to stand up to that richness of the beef that they're getting out of Argentina. So they make their, their uh, Malbecs rather rich. So like, and, and weighty and, and heavy and like, um, tannic and stuff like that to break down the meat, the beef. So one of the other places that I really, really love Malbec that I think uh, does a really real great job at like, um, I guess, food and, and the wines out there is uh, Cahors, uh, which is in France. France, Cahors is a small area in the Loire Valley that makes Malbec. And in Cahors, uh, they do truffles, they, like they grow truffles. So they have dogs that go find these truffles. You know how expensive truffles are, the mushroom. And so they have to have the, a wine that stands up to it. They call it the black wine in, in, in Cahor. And so you have these really dense, dark, tannic, like uh, black wines uh, of Malbec out of Cahor. And, they, and I tend to use a lot, like when I'm pairing, trying to find something to pair with truffles, I always try to find like a really rich Malbec that'll cover that'll cover that. The reason, another reason I like Malbec so much is because it's not as, as expensive as Cabernet Sauvignon from Lodi, from Napa, from Sonoma. When I go to these restaurants and, you know, you're always looking for like, I want wine to pair with my food. So I spend all this money on like um, filet mignon, right? It's like $40, $50 for a filet mignon, uh, eight ounce. And I'm like, yo, what am I gonna find to pair well with this? I don't wanna, I don't wanna break the bank because I spent all this money on the food. What am I gonna find that's gonna Malbec is always a good choice because Malbec is one of those things that normally doesn't cost a lot, doesn't cost as much as those calves that I was telling you about, but gives a little bit more of a uh, complexity and a little bit more dimension to your your red meat. 
with um, with this one. So uh, highly recommend Malbec for those. Um, I also like Malbec for like little for uh, charcuterie too. Um, I don't know how many times I've had like a, a kind of like a salta uh, Argentina Malbec with uh, cured meat such as salami and prosciutto and stuff like that. They they go really really well with that too. So again. Malbec as a grape is a dynamic grape. It goes with a lot of different dishes. And so um, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it for everybody, especially if you don't want to break the bank on the wine. So that's a little bit about pairing. I can go more into it, but, you know, I don't want to go crazy. You guys can always hit me up on the DM and ask me more questions about Malbec, but I'm just going to leave it there. And um, with you, since, since you love Malbec so much, um, what are something that you like? Some things that you like to eat with it? Uh, burger steaks. Usually, mm -hmm. I, I pair with uh, red meats. I, I mean, I, I Malbec is is one of those where I, I like to pair it with food, but at the same time after a meal, because you know me, I'm pretty much wine and bourbon. Yeah. So Malbec is that bold wine that I can drink around eight or nine o'clock and maybe a little bit after that I might open up some bourbon and have some bourbon with it it's just consistent with me I don't necessarily have to pair it with anything but man I guess to my palate I've had many a Malbec before and every single one of them I liked I really can't tell you a Malbec that I didn't like I can't say that for other um, varietals I really can't it's but I can tell. It's, it's, it's consistent, man. You can't go wrong with it. And, and everybody, all of my customers that I have that have ordered that Diente Malbec, they're, they are all happy with it. I yeah. haven't had one person say, you know what? I, I really didn't like this one. So that's top three in my recommendations. I mean, it's, it's real easy for me and I because I know that they're going to like it. So yeah. that's what I love about Malbec. It, it just um, it speaks to me and it speaks to a lot of people. California, and, respect to California, too, because they're kind of coming up on the Malbec stuff. Like their Malbecs that are coming out of California recently, I've been floored by how how um, well balanced they are and how delicious they are. Um, so I have a little I have a little game I want to do really quick. Um, oh, okay, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I'm, putting on the spot. Uh -oh. I'm putting you on the spot to put me on the spot because this is okay. not going to it's not going to come out in my favor. But I want to explain the the science behind pairing uh, to people who are listening. So uh, what I basically want to do is like, I want you to throw out a, a dish to me, no matter what it is. You get three of them, and I gotta I gotta tell you what wine I I would pair with it, and on top of that, I gotta explain to you why I would pair that wine with. It. We'll do three of them. Maybe okay. we'll do the same sometime down the road with some other with some other stuff. But like, yeah, I I, I want to have some fun. So let's let's go there. Let's go there. Let's see. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to challenge you at, at the start. All right. Let's go salmon and asparagus and uh, scalloped potatoes. That would be your meal. Okay. What would you pair that with? Because I've had that before, and I wouldn't know. I mean, a white wine, maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't know exactly what to pair. Maybe I'm wrong. But what would you pair that with? That would be for dinner tonight. So we got salmon, asparagus, and um, and what kind of scalloped potatoes? Yes. Okay. Give me a second. Let me think. I'll be specific with this too. Can I go? Oh, you know what? Oh, that would be better. Got it. Okay. So for me, I'm not going to be this specific with every one, every one of you these like dishes, but this one, I already ha I have it in my head and I'm going with it. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Keenan Chardonnay uh, off of Spring Mountain, Napa. These guys do no malolactic fermentation. It's one of the only places in Napa that does not do that. Uh, so you don't get all that, um, that kind of like, you don't get all the extra stuff. You don't get all that, um, I would say, popcorn, buttery you don't get any of that because it's not too oaky is it it's not oaky at all this is like not at all one of the most balanced chardonnays you can get out of napa you're going to get a lot of pear you're going to get a lot of green apple um and i think and, it, and it's rich enough and acidic enough to balance out the richness of the salmon uh that's the science behind it I, i'm with salmon salmon can be really really rich i love salmon 
my lady, I think, makes the best salmon. Um, I hope she's not listening to this because I want to head <laughs> deeper. But her salmon is amazing, and she does it really fast. Um, that Keenan Chardonnay with the salmon, I think it's just going to elevate it. It's going to give a little bit more acid to that salmon. It's going to break it down. Um, it's going to be beautiful. I think that that goes really, really well. If you're talking about asparagus, you want something that's not going to be too green because um, you don't want to you don't want to uh, push the asparagus to too much greenness. You want to give it a counterbalance. And I think this weight and this little bit of like this kind of peach note that's going on, this fruity uh, note that goes on at the beginning of the palate with the Chardonnay is going to go amazingly well with the asparagus. And as for the potatoes, potatoes, the scalloped potato can be rich again. You have enough acid in this Chardonnay to balance out that too. So I think this this Chardonnay, this Kenyan Chardonnay, is the perfect wine for that dish. That's just what I think. And that's off the top of the head, yo. Like there's other wines I'm thinking really about, good. but off the top of my head, that's the one that would balance it out because you're getting weight, acid, fruit, like pure fruit, and um, I think it will just elevate that dish quite a bit. So yeah, Kenyan on okay. Mountain. If you guys don't know, <laughs> got it. I got another one for you. All right. Okay. So try tip. Let's do a try tip and let's do, um, obviously you have to pair it with the potato, just the regular with the, the fingerling potatoes. Okay. So it's somewhat of a not too flavorful potato. You may put a little butter on it. Okay. Um, Got a little bread in there. I'm trying to think of the last time we had tri-tip. And then I think we cooked broccoli with it. Okay. All right. I think, Let me we, I, I think we had broccoli with it. So tri-tip broccoli, greenling potatoes. Okay. I think I remember. I know what I paired with it. So I'm kind of interested to see what you, you would pair it with. Because tri-tip has a little different taste than yeah. a regular steak. So that's why I said that. It's not, it's not like the uh, filet mignon. It's not like the New York strip. Yeah. It has a little different taste to it. I got it. All right. So this bottle is going to be coming out soon. I got a chance to taste it before anybody got a chance to taste it. Um, I think I put a, I did a review on it um, on my, uh, I think it was like on a wine Wednesday, a few, like maybe a couple months ago. So there's this uh, Latin family that's making wine out of Napa and uh, these guys is called the Ortega family wines right oh, I, I heard them before they have a Malbec it's the first time this guy's ever done Malbec before he has a Malbec that's coming out that I got to taste before he even put the label on the bottle and he made sure that he bottled it already before it had any kind of bottle shock he you no, know, he bottled it and then he wanted to get it. he made sure he didn't have any bottle shock before he got it over to me I tasted it amazing so if i'm trying to pair something with this dish i think that is going to go like it's gonna it's gonna elevate the dish so much uh it's rich it's a lot of blue and, and purple fruit here so you're getting a lot of blueberries plums blackberries with this one with this wine and i think uh for uh tri-tip they're gonna it's gonna be like a, a match made in heaven you know like the orchestra and the choir going head for head to see like uh what's better they're gonna keep on pushing each other to to like um, to the highest level, I think that they're, they're not bashing each other, but like accompanying each other on this journey. I think that Ortega family Malbec that's coming out, along with the tri tip, is going to be great. Now for the other things on the sides, of course, you know it, it, it'll deal with that. It, it'll be good with that too. But the show, the, from what I heard, from what you told me, the sh the the showrunner, the the headliner, is that tri tip, and so. I would I would say that Malbec would go really well with that. It'll go good with the baked potato too, of course. Baked potato is easy. I mean, you don't really want to pair. You don't norm, normally people don't really pair wines with that unless it's like the the, the kind of like the headliner of the show. Um, but I think it go really well with that. And then the last thing was was uh, green. What would you say as far as broccoli? Broccoli. Broccoli would kill with this because, like, for whatever reason, I I actually and I other people say not to pair red wine with with uh, vegetables so much because you get this kind of like oily taste. But I think broccoli and this uh, specific Malbec will go really well because it's fruit forward. 
And so you're not going to get all that. Um, I don't think you're going to get any of that uh, greenness and that, that kind of foiled taste in your mouth by pairing it with broccoli. Um, so, yeah, I would say that the uh, Ortega family uh, Malbec would go really, really well with that. Right. Yeah, I'll have to try that out. So okay, you have any, any meals in mind? So I've tested you, so I'm willing to be tested. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see here. Um, I got a good one. All right, trout. So, oh. so trout, fish. Trout, uh, trout with um, asparagus. And this trout also is like uh, with lemon butter on it. So like it has like that kind of like lemon, okay. lemon garlic butter thing going on. You have the you have the the brock or sorry the uh, asparagus, and then let's say mashed potatoes. Okay. Oh man. Um. Well, in the past, I've paired. So it's either going to be a Sauvignon Blanc. Be specific about the Sauvignon Blanc too, because like, okay. it's either New Zealand or it's going to be Loire. It's going to be Sancerre area, which is France. And it's, so the differences between the two, Sancerre is a little bit more reserved. It's not so yes. uh, edge strong. And then you got New Zealand that jumps out the glass at you. <laughs> yeah. The, the one from New Zealand, from what I understand, is that's very acidic. Yeah. Right? More and acidic. Both, I, I, both, I know the Rieslings are very, very acidic, like you mentioned before. Yeah. I would probably say, man, trout. I, I, I swear, I haven't had, that's a tough one. I haven't had trout in probably 15 years. Oh, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. I'm, I'm trying, man, one of the last ones I had. <laughs> I've had all the other fish, fish before, but so I might be wrong, but maybe I would go on the I, I Australian let's side. Let's switch it. We can do sea bass. Sea bass is air, most people have had sea bass recently, and I love sea bass. So, so let's I, would, go. I would go with the Sancerre. Okay. Because yeah. that, that would be more of a delicate one. Yeah. It wouldn't be so bold. Okay. To pair it with that. Uh, sea bass because sea bass is kind of just kind of a light um buttery type fish mm -hmm. from what i remember i haven't had it in about two years but when it's good it's good i, yeah. I usually order it at a good restaurant and it's pricey but um that's what i would do again i'm not familiar and this is why we do this show uh, well not exactly why we do it but this is an educational show it's fun to talk about this so the next time i will know what to do and i wouldn't sound like a dummy <laughs> if somebody asked me, hey, Scott, you're in the wine. What would you pair this with? <laughs> so no, I'm just, no, I'm like just trying to gain as much knowledge as I can. And fish is really hard for me to pair. I mean, it's hard. It's good, though, man. Sancerre is like a good choice. I would, I understand Sancerre being the choice for that dish. Um, Sancerre, I would also say, so this is one that people don't really know about, but should probably read up on a little bit more. Uh, I would say a uh, pick pool out of Languedoc, France. It's a certain varietal that um, has a lot of weight to it for, for a white wine. It's like aged on the lees. And it goes, the, the, the stuff that you get out of like a, a Sauvignon Blanc from Sancerre, you're going to get that, but you're also going to get a little bit of weight to the, so that it, it's able to like to be sustainable with, um, with this dish and a different flavor profile too. You can get some herbs, a little bit of spice with a pig pool sometimes. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's a different, and I think it gives you a little bit more of a balance there, but I'd love Sancerre with the dish. Like that was a good choice. Um, especially because okay. people don't know about pig pool. And I mean, that's just me being nerdy and going to like the nerd side. Be like, I would try and pick pool with that. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah man, I, I love Sancerre with that. I love Sancerre with that. So. Okay. Yeah. I find myself at restaurants now looking at the wine list and looking to see what they have. And some of the things that we've talked about, like next time I, I go to a restaurant, I'm just going to look and, and see if they have that Sancerre or um, what is that one that you pick? pick, pick for? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to see if they have that there. And, and um, but no, I, I mean, it's fun. I, I think it's interesting because I think my group of friends is getting more and more interested in wine, not just because I am, but I think that's just our environment today. Yeah. 
the 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 younger population is getting more into wine. Even even the the what the Generation X is what they're calling it. The high uh, the the college students that yeah. are, are graduating, they're 21, 22 years old. They're starting to get into wines, and I mean, for us in our early 40s, I mean, we've we've been into wine for for a few years. But I think it's really cool to see the younger population getting more involved in the wine. So. That's something that I'm loving right now, man. Like I'm, my whole thing right now is to get younger people into, like younger, like 21 and up, into wine because I I went through the whole phase. Stage. I remember being around people who only drank, you know, who only drunk beer. I drank beer. Like I mean, I was serious into it for a long time. Um, the fact that we're able, we're trying to get, you know, more of a younger crowd into it, um, and you can see, and you'll see the differences in the industry itself, like. Before we were making wine to age, now they're making wine to pop and pour. And that's because mm -hmm. of the attention span of the youth. We want to be able to be like, this is a great beverage. You don't have to age this. You can just pop this open and drink it right out of the bottle and you'll enjoy it. And that's and, and because the, in, the industry is gearing towards or, or shift, is shifting towards that. Um, a lot of the more younger people I'm seeing in the bars and the wine bar and the restaurants talking about wine. It's really cool. Uh, it's part of the reason why I... Like right now, I'm, I'm in the midst of uh, publishing a book uh, called It's a Vibe. Um, and with uh, I'm collaborating with Chef Armando Tam. He's a like, world-renowned like, cook chef, uh, bi-coastal uh, cook chef that like loves and he's very passionate about food. And so when we met, we started talking about like, you know, I'm into wine, he's into food, like what I would pair with certain dishes he had. And he wanted to write a book. And I was like, yo, I have a publishing company but at first I was still like, I don't know about collaborating with anybody because I've never done that before. It's always been my own stuff that I've been publishing. He talked me into it. And um, now we're about to, we're about to like tie up a, po a, a project that's going to be released before Christmas. And uh, right now we're doing pre-sales right now. So if you're mm -hmm. buy, um, it's right now we're doing pre-sales for bulk buying. So 10 books or more, um, but we're doing it at a really reasonable price of $20 per, per unit. Cause the retail is, going to, is thirty dollars a unit, mm -hmm. and so, so we're giving ten dollars off for people who are buying twenty books or more, or sorry, ten books or more. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, man, it's that was the part of, when we were talking about marketing. I said I wanted to market to the youth, and he's a marketing guy. He was like, "Yo, let's do it. Let's make it. Let's find a title that everybody understands. It's a vibe. It's something that we're trying to create for everybody. We want you to enjoy the process of eating, drinking, and listening to music while you're." eating and drinking and cooking this, this meal. And so for every, every meal, every dish, we have a, uh, a album that's going to be associated, uh, two albums that are going to be associated with every single dish. So that you throw this album on and listen to it while you're cooking up the dish, while you have your date waiting for you to finish up cooking and you guys are drinking wine and having a good time. That, we're trying to set a vibe. So that was mm -hmm. one of the, we want to get the youth. We're trying to get the youth to, you know, look into what we're doing, what wine is all about, and not in a um, pretentious way. So that's the whole point of this. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's good that you brought that up. I'm excited to, to read the book. You know, I read your last one, and um, there's various subjects that, that even before we started this podcast that we talked about that we'd like to have shows on. And one of the things that we talked about the youth, we talked about culture and wine. And for you and I, so I'm, I'm half Black and half Mexican, so stereotypically, that's when people think about wine, unfortunately, the black community is not mentioned. The Mexican community is not mentioned. That's something that I really want to talk to you about later on in life or, or later on in, in the podcast, uh, maybe the next episode or a couple of episodes later. Yes. But that's something that I think our audience would, be, would, would really dig to. Uh, I, I know I'm excited to talk to you about that. Um, I can't wait. Bro. I you have a lot to share and may, maybe some things that you've experienced on uh, becoming a sommelier, some of yeah. the things that you went through and maybe some stereotypes that you felt from people or uh, maybe some discrimination, who knows? Maybe, I don't, I don't want to get too uh, personal with it, but um, this show, it, it, it's, it's, it's real. I, I want it to be authentic and, and, yeah. and it, is, it is what it is. And we hope our audience accepts that. And, and we appreciate you guys listening we love talking about wine. I love learning about wine. I know Jayton loves teaching and I'm sure he's still learning too. 
Always. So this is why this is why we do it. So cheers to all you who, who listened today. Right. And we look forward to our next episode. Definitely. And that's actually one of the reasons why, like being honest with you, I wrote the book because a lot of the content in this in this uh, cookbook is about diversity. We have women winemakers uh, in the book. We have black Latin winemakers in the book. Um, and we wanted to we wanted it to be a collaboration where we could bring everybody in and like, you know, showcase what they're doing, because there's a lot of amazing wines that are outside of the realm of a lot of people who don't um, like specifically look for minorities making wine and stuff like that. So uh, that's the whole point of this book was to kind of showcase and and sh uh, shine a light on some of these people that are really killing it at, in the industry. So that was the whole that was the whole point. But. Yeah, man. I hope you guys check it out. And thank you so much for checking out our show. Um, we're going to continue to pump, pump out uh, episodes for you guys because we enjoy it. And uh, hope you guys learned something. Uh, remember to like our stuff, subscribe, follow us, and we are going to keep on putting stuff out for you guys to enjoy. So until next time, guys, cheers. Scott, appreciate cheers. you as always, my brother. And uh, guys, cheers. Till next time.